If you're not a good public speaker, you can just demonstrate exercises and go through some tips and so forth on how to do that. A lot of trainers put stuff on YouTube and they get a lot of business. It's not training that they're putting up there, but that's another story. I don't go to YouTube. Ha ha ha. Now next. Okay, so putting video files up there is great for people that are not writers. You can have 15, 16, 20, 30 exercises on your website where people just click on one, they see some information, they like what they see, and now they want to buy your video. All right, so that's a very powerful mechanism. It's not that difficult to do. You have a camcorder at home, you upload the file into your computer, you put it up on the web, it's fairly easy. So content can be where you're a video-based website. You're not even writing articles, you just have tons of exercises. And these honestly generate the most traffic. Because not too many people want to read a lot of stuff, but everyone doesn't mind looking at video files and clicking on stuff. All right, so that's another thing to keep in mind. Audio interviews are another thing. This is a very powerful mechanism. You find experts in your business, people that maybe are more successful than you, have websites that get more traffic than you, athletes, celebrities, whatever, and you just say you want to interview them. That's how you approach them. I want to interview for my website. I want to interview you for another website. So you're not asking them to do anything for you. This is a common mistake that people make with networking. They approach someone and they go, can you do this for me? 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 And I can tell you from someone that has a lot of people doing that to me, I just, I just shut off and say, no, I can't do anything for you. All right, always approach people leading with, here's what's in it for you. I wanna interview you for my website, get some business your way. I wanna do an audio interview with you for this website, get some business your way. Audio interviews are where you just record the conversation and here's a very inexpensive way to do it. Get a Skype account. Does everyone know what that is? It's basically a computer to computer phone calls. So you tell the other person that you're gonna be interviewing to sign up for Skype. You sign up for it. You call them from your Skype account to their Skype account. A Couple reasons why you wanna use this path. One, it's free. So if you're calling people long distance, it's free. Two, you can actually record the conversation right there into your computer. It's already in your computer, and all you need to do is upload it onto your website, and you've got content. And think about this one. You could literally add 20 interviews in a month. Every day you just interview someone, you get it up on the website, and there you go. Why you want to interview other people is you want to diversify your website so it's not just about you. It also shows people, wow, this person's connected. Look at all the people that are connected with this person. For example, one of the best UFC fighters ever is a guy named Frank Shamrock. He's a guy developed a professional relationship with over the years where I gave him some training information and so forth. He really liked what I had to say, gave me a nice testimonial. But the first thing I did with him when I networked with him, because he didn't know me at all at the time, I was just getting started in the business, is I said, look, I'd love to interview you for a magazine that I write for. I wasn't writing for any magazines at the time. All right? I just said, I want to interview for a magazine. Most people aren't going to ask you what magazine, this and that, and so forth. So I interviewed him. I got it published in thetnation.com. It's another, it's a really good website. And to this day, when you put Frank Shamrock into Google, I'm in the top five with that interview, all right? So here's a guy who's a much bigger name than myself, but I'm leveraging his name in a very classy way. It's helping him out. People are putting his name into Google and they're finding out about me. And I've got tons of people like that. I've got tons of stories like that. So you know, my, gener my website generates about two million hits every month and 30,000 unique visitors. So that's a lot of traffic coming through. And a lot of it is from doing these kind of clever ways of leveraging other people's names. Now my name is pretty well established and so forth. A lot of people are gonna come directly. But in the very beginning, it was very important to leverage other people's names. All right, case studies with clients. A lot of you do private training, a lot of you do boot camps. Take before and after pictures and then write in detail exactly what the client did to get the results that you produced for him or her. These are very powerful, much better than a testimonial where you just have a before and after picture write down exactly what you did with this person because a lot of us don't believe before and after pictures anymore. Kind of reminds us of cybergenics, remember that? Remember hot stuff, remember all these different ads out there? It's kind of the oldest trick in the book. You can use a lot of lighting tricks, you can tape someone's waist back so they look like they lost weight. All right, so rather than just slap some photos up on a website, explain exactly how that client went from point A to point B. These are what I call case studies, and you can literally have hundreds of these on your website. You can literally add one every week or every month from people you're working with. Get it on your website, bam, you're ready to go. Fitness tips. Now this is very simple stuff, because it's not only important to add content, you want to add content that can be updated fairly easily for you. Again, you don't want to have one article every five years. It has to be more consistent than that. It doesn't have to be every week, it doesn't have to be every day. 
but it should be at least once a month you're adding something to your website to give people a reason to come back. A lot of people who visit my website always tell me, they go, I'm constantly coming back to your website because I want to see what's new. I want to see what else has been added. I want to see what's going on. All right, if I added one article every couple years, I guarantee you I might get someone once, but they're not coming back. So it has to be updated. Fitness tips are easy to update. This could be just a one paragraph tip on a nutrition tip, a weight loss tip, a size and strength tip, and so forth. While we're talking about fitness tips, here's a mistake you want to avoid. Many people will say, develop a newsletter with a fitness tip that you send out to a customer every single day. Sounds good in theory, right? The more exposure you get, the more clients you're gonna get. Have any of you ever signed up for something where they're sending you an email every day? What happened after about two weeks of that? Did you look forward to it or was it irritating? Okay, it's kind of like a actor or actress, they come out with too, mov too many movies at the same time. There's a reason why the A-list actors will do one movie and then they disappear for a couple of years because you get sick of seeing them. You want it to be fresh and so forth. So don't overexpose yourself because what happens is now people just shut off whenever they see an email from you, whenever they hear your name, they're just going, oh, forget it. And many people make this mistake. Once every two weeks, I find, is ideal. You just provide really good content rather than just a couple snippets every day that people don't have time to look at or people just get, frankly, get irritated with. All right. Another thing you can do is your training journal. <laughs> a lot of us as fitness professionals forget one thing that's very important, to actually work out ourselves. All right? There's nothing more discouraging to a customer than being a fat trainer or an out-of-shape trainer. It's like, all right, 50 more push-ups. <sighs> How are you doing over there? Well, they're going to look at you and go, I'm doing better than you are, all right? Why am I paying you? You should be paying me. And we laugh at this, but I see a lot of fat trainers all the time, and I just roll my eyes. I go, God, you're supposed to convey confidence to me? You're fat. You're out of shape. All right? So there, I think there's some kind of organization that says, hey, let's give fat people a chance. They should be trainers too. <laughs> no. All right? I'm not one of those guys. <laughs> And that's a whole other rant. You don't have to be ripped, you don't have to be a big bodybuilder, but come on. You have to be in shape to the point where you're instilling some confidence in a customer. When I do my kettlebell workshops, the second I walk in the room, they know it's gonna be a good workshop, all right? They're not waiting, they don't have to wait until a couple hours into it and go, oh, he's pretty good. He didn't really look like he was in shape, or he didn't look like he was strong, I'm surprised. The second you walk in the room, you should already have the customer sold going, wow, this person's gonna be good. An old boss of mine, when I worked for other people, told me that the second someone walks in the room for an interview, he knew whether he was going to hire them or not. It sounds almost, what are you talking about? But that's the initial response we get from people. You don't get that second chance to nail that first impression. So the, one of the most important things that we need to do as trainers is make sure that we work out consistently. And then we can use that to create more content. Every time you work out, put it in a training journal. How many of us tell our customers to write training journals, keep track of stuff? Okay, then how many of you actually do it for yourself? Okay, about half, all right? So we need to keep training journals for ourselves, lead by example, and then you can upload those journals onto your website as actual content, all right? People often look at my website to see what I'm doing and so forth, and then what's cool is if I'm doing something that's new, that's also a new product to my website, they're going, oh wow, Mike's doing that, I wanna do it too, they go buy the product. And these are all great ways to establish value without being in the customer's face and saying, look at me, look at me, look at this, look at this, go look at this, go buy this, go buy that. It's not desperate, it's positioned. You never want to prospect, you want to be positioned, all right? For example, for those of you guys who do online dating, you're not positioned, buddy, all right? Okay, you're on there, you're emailing some girl, she gets 10,000 emails every hour, like the one you just sent here. That's an example of prospecting, it's not being positioned. Your website should be something that is positioned. You're not out there prospecting, desperate to get attention. Look at me, come to my website, please buy something. Always instill confidence, even when you're not making any money. That's the most important time to just come out like, hey, I know I've got good material here, and I know I've got good stuff, and I know I'm worth your time. Okay. All right. All right, so again, content's important because it really demonstrates value to your customer. I've written articles for several magazines. I've, in fact, I've had articles in every single fitness magazine out there, except for Oxygen, all right? But I've been in a lot of them. I don't want to corner a Bedros' market with Oxygen, so I, I stay out of that one. I've had many offers, but you know, I, don't, I don't want to corner his Vortex articles in Oxygen magazine. All right, 
Okay, so content's important because, again, it establishes you as an expert. Someone reads an article in a magazine, they go, wow, that was a great article. Just the fact that he's in the magazine, he must be, he must be good. Now, perception is reality. A lot of us know that most of the stuff in magazines is garbage. I mean, most of us probably don't even read a lot of these fitness magazines anymore because how many articles can you read on how to increase your bench press by 50 pounds or how to add four inches to your guns or how to have great glutes and so forth, all right? These are the same recycled information that's in magazines. But this is still a large distribution plane to get your stuff into. So what happens is you write an article in a magazine and it just gives you a little bit of name recognition. You get paid to do it and so forth. But the real money is not gonna be made from writing that article. The real money is not made from getting into those places. It just looks good on your resume and maybe gets people to take a look at your website a little bit. The content that is most important are articles that you actually publish on your own website or other websites, such as tnation.com is a really good website that gets a lot of high traffic. Bodybuilding.com is a really good website. I have a lot of people writing articles for my website. So I invite you to send articles to my website and I'll make sure to delete them once I receive them and just give you the illusion that I looked at them, all right? But all joking aside, send me some articles that you think are a fit for my website. If I like them, I'll put them up on my website, I'll put it in my newsletter, and I'll send a lot of traffic your way. Again, I get a lot of traffic. Con articles on the web that you don't get paid for, you're not making any money in the front end. That's why a lot of people go, I don't wanna write an article if I'm not getting paid for it. It's like, all right, you're missing the whole point because you're writing this free content, it's the back end where you make a lot of money. Some people have these websites where they charge $3,000 a month, not $3,000 a month, they're making $3,000 a month off subscribers. So in other words, they're charging maybe $10 a month just to read the articles on the website. They're making money on the front end. A couple thousand dollars a month is generally what the more successful ones are making. Some make more than that. But what's happening is that's all the money they're making. There's no back end income. See, my website is positioned the opposite. Tons and tons of free information, overwhelming amount of free information to a large degree, which means people keep coming back to keep reading stuff. That's why I get a lot of traffic. All the money is made on the back end through my videos, my eBooks, my online program design stuff. You make way more money on the back end than you will do on the front end. And we'll talk more about back ends at the party after this. Okay. All right. <laughs> Little delayed reaction there, that's okay. All right, okay, get content to diversify your site, write a bunch of articles, and then get other people to write articles for you. For example, my affiliate program, you sign up for it for free, you can sell my products for free. Not only that, but I give you five articles that I've written that you can take and put on your website. So right there, with one registration, you've already gotten five more articles full of content. John Berardi, another great guy, does the same thing. He gives you about eight articles that you can add to your website. So you can get a lot of really good stuff out there through solid affiliate programs. You can have 50 articles added to your website by the end of the week. The more articles, the more content you have, the better you're gonna come up in search engines because you're leveraging other people's names that may have much more of an space, internet space than you do. So it's something that is kind of a no-brainer. Definitely a no-brainer. All right. Okay, we already went over this. $50,000 just made doing affiliate programs, and this is completely passive. You know, last year my affiliate program was less than $20,000. So my income has continued to go up. It was $150,000 profit in 2006. It was $220,000 profit in 2007. The kicker is what? I worked less. Okay, I want to get to the point where I never leave my house. I want to get to the point where I'm just in the corner with a gun waiting for a nuclear <laughs> war to come, all right? <laughs> so this is not a business where you even have to like people. I hate people. I'm just kidding. All right. I mean, <laughs> kind of true, but not completely true. All right. With my business model, what happened is I've used to do a lot of workshops. Like when I first started in around, let's say 2002 is when I first got my business going. It's, it was basically a kettlebell training focused business. It was something where I saw it as a ground floor opportunity. It was something that I really wanted to jump into. I knew it would take off a couple years later and I could really capitalize on that, which I have. It's worked out very well for me. So at that time, I basically took a business model of, let's say, what a guy in a band would do, where you just go on tour promoting who you are. So I did workshops all over the country. I did some overseas. This is a lot of hard work right here, especially in the very beginning where you're not making that much. I used to drive from LA to Arizona to make 400 bucks in a weekend. I wouldn't even walk out to the mailbox today to get a 400 bucks, all right? But this is the way, this is paying your dues. This is what you have to do in the beginning. So my business model at that time was doing a ton of workshops. I had no products, I had no affiliate programs. Workshops, online program design. Really hustling to get my name out there. 
Second year, I started shifting gears here. I started adding some affiliate programs. What I was making was pocket change. I mean, you're making 50, 100 bucks a month, nothing, nothing to rave about. I still had no products, but I'm starting to develop these other income planes. I'm starting to get more online customers, which is not as much of a stress as working with people personally or traveling and so forth, doing a lot of workshops, all right? 2006 was kind of a tipping point where it was, okay, 50% passive income via my products, via my eBooks, via affiliate programs, and then the other 50% is me just really out there hustling and doing my workshops. At this point, they're very lucrative. Now I'm making six, seven, ten thousand dollars $10,000 in a day and a weekend doing seminars. Still a lot of hard work though. It's a lot of hard work to book the facility, write the ad copy, get everyone registered, make sure there's kettlebells in sight, teach the actual workshop and so forth. Basically, I did everything to get that workshop going. But the payoff was down the road, I knew that I could get to the point where my name is big enough that my products will sell really well to the point where I'm making a really nice income, all right? Now, just off of the affiliate program last year and doing some online program design, let's see. Just off of those two income sources, and I have about six income sources, just off those two, it was about an $80,000 income. This is $80,000 without leaving your couch, without walking out the front door. So it's a nice little supplementary income. Now add $127,000 to that, which is what I made off of my own products. And you have almost a $200,000 income, add in some workshops, you got a $225,000 income where really 90% of it is passive other people's products and my own products. So I'm not saying that my business model is the best. I'm not saying that you should close down your studios and stop doing boot camps and stop taking private clients. What I am saying is you don't want to be bound to your billable hours. There's only so much you're going to make with your billable hours. So while you're doing one business model, you want to start adding in other stuff. And what I do can be added to any business model that's out there. Whatever you're doing, you can add and incorporate what I'm doing to that and make a lot more. Now you can see my personalized program design income went down quite a bit from 2006 to 2007. That's actually a positive thing because that's actual work. That's actual hard work and working with people and so forth and it's a lot of brain work, all right? What happened is my affiliate income went way up, my personalized program dipped down a little bit, but my product income, my passive income has gone up astronomically. So that's the business model that I wanted to have where I get to the point where if I choose to, I can just make a great living with passive income and not have to worry about getting new clients and client retention and this and so forth. Just making information products where there's no geographical boundaries and you can make as much as you want. I know people that make a million dollars a year just selling their own self-published information products. Okay. All right, more, we, tomorrow we're gonna talk more about how to make videos inexpensively, how to market videos inexpensively and so forth. At this point, let's start taking some questions. If you have a few questions, let's start throwing them out. Hold it, I said! Again, buy my videos, not the Vortex machine. <laughs> yeah, same price, you know. <laughs> I also um, have some kettlebells, too, if anyone wants this. Um, what do you do about getting this stuff on the web? I mean, do you have a web designer, or are you It's not that hard proficient? to do it on your own, okay? It's not that expensive to hire a web designer, either. In fact, my web designer, who you can email me for his contact information, for just a basic website, a couple pages and so forth, I mean, it really shouldn't cost you more than a couple hundred bucks at the most. I mean, you can get a nice website up for $100. It costs maybe $8 a month to host it. So we're not looking at a high cost avenue here. It can be very inexpensive. Are you talking about something like Homestead, that type of a page? No, I would do something a little bit more high level than that. You don't, you don't want to do a website where someone else's branding is on it. You want to have it where it's your own. But again, that's not difficult to do. You just look for, all you need to do is get a web host. Again, the less money you have, the more stuff you need to do on your own. Like my very first video, my brother and I collaborated. He bought the video camera, he learned how to do the editing, and we did the whole thing in-house. And we just split the cost and split the profit as well. Now, the profit was so good that the second time around, I said, okay, this time I'm just gonna pay you on the front end, not on the back end, <laughs> all right? But the point is, a lot of people get discouraged when they think about information products. I'm gonna get into this more tomorrow, but they feel like if they don't get published by someone else, then there's no other avenue, and you can really make a lot more self-publishing than you can working with someone else. None of this stuff is that expensive. Good. Go back. Go the other questions. Up. If yeah. you already have a product, do you have a company that you can create affiliate programs through? Yeah, yeah. 
Okay, if you already had, the question is, if you have products, how do you create an affiliate program for your own products? You sign up with a shopping cart website just called iShopping.com. It's called iShopping.com. Okay, it's going to cost anywhere from maybe $50 to $100 a month, and you can develop an affiliate program through them for your products. It's something I started doing maybe six months ago. Take, be patient with affiliate programs for your own products, though, because you need to have visitor traffic. You need to actually have people come into your website to sign up for it. So there's a time and place for everything. Before you try, start trying to sell other people, make sure you actually get some traffic to your website first. Right. Any other questions? Get my work out in for the day. Yeah. Uh, if you use someone else's articles on your website, how do you get around the duplicate content issues from Google? Yeah, it's a good question. Good question. The, the question is, when you use other people's articles on your website, how do you get around duplicate content? For example, maybe there's 10 we kettlebell websites from instructors that all have the same 10 Mike Mahler articles. It's one thing, I mean, right to the point, it's not something I would worry about because chances are people aren't visiting all of those websites. So for example, when someone says, well, Mike, I don't want to compete with you, I'm like, you're not competing with me. <laughs> all right, because I don't look at it that way. My webs I'm, I'm content with my own websites. I know how to put myself out there in a unique way. So just because you have content on your website that's maybe on a lot of other websites doesn't mean that everyone else is going to see that. And if they do, big deal. It's not a big deal. But you can get around that also by writing your own stuff that's unique and only have it on your website, which I do as well. And you can turn articles into products. That's tomorrow. When you write 20 articles, you can make an ebook out of that and now make an additional income. Two more questions, and we'll take a dinner break. One there. On your website, do you have other people's kettlebell uh, videos or just your own? Not yet, but I, I'm planning on putting some more because my business model is shifting more to kind of being a production company where I'm helping out other people. Like I do market other people's kettlebell workshops on my website and I take a piece of the action for that. I write the ad copy, I register people, and then I take 40% for that, which sounds excessive, but these, it's not about how much I'm taking, it's about how much they're making. And they're making $5,000 a day when they only used to make 500. So it's not about the percentage I take, but yes, I will be doing that in the future.